All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the Rethinking Public Spaces webinar. We will be getting started in just a few moments. So if you are joining us, we're thrilled to have you here today. It is also apparently National Coffee Day. So if you have not gotten your coffee yet, you can go grab that now and then come back in a moment and join our fabulous panelists so we can have a nice conversation about rethinking public spaces. And a few notes, you can see us, but we can't see you. So you're a key part of the conversation and we hope you'll be joining us in the chat, but you won't be on screen. So if you're still in pajamas, we don't know it. Hi, Jim McPherson. Maybe Jessica can tell us more about uh, where to find some great coffee and where, what public spaces that she recommends we drink that coffee in, in Phoenix. All right, I know some folks are still joining us. We'll give it another moment here. If you just joined us, you are in the Rethinking Public Spaces online forum. You can see us, but we can't see you. And we'll be getting started shortly. Good morning, everyone. I can see that we're already having a fruitful conversation about coffee. We'll be having a great conversation about public spaces, uh, where we can find great coffee all across the state of Arizona because we have folks here from Flagstaff, Tucson, and Phoenix on our panel today. And if you are joining us as a attendee, we hope that you will join us in the chat. We can here or we cannot see you and we cannot hear you so you're automatically muted but we hope that you will be part of the conversation and chat with us today and ask your questions of our panelists all right so let's go ahead and get started since it's 1102 thank you all so much for taking the time to join this online conversation about rethinking public spaces my name is Serena Unrein, and I'm with the Arizona Partnership for Healthy Communities. And along with our co-hosts at Living Streets Alliance and Pinnacle Prevention, we're really excited to have this conversation about what we can do to rethink public spaces during this time of a global pandemic to make sure that all people in our communities can stay safe, active, and connected. A few things to note before we get our conversation started shortly. You might have heard me say this already, but just to reiterate, we cannot see you, but you can see us. You are still a critical part of this conversation though, even though we can't see or hear you. So we hope that you will join us in the chat and tell us about what your favorite public spaces are. Tell us what you're thinking and please ask questions of our wonderful panelists who are here to share their experience from their communities and their expertise. We will also be recording this online forum and sending out a link to the recording to everyone who registered. And once again, I'll ask you to please ask questions. We'll be taking audience questions throughout the conversation, so please share your questions in the chat box. And without further ado, I'll have our four panelists introduce themselves by sharing who they are, where they work, and what their favorite public space is. So let's get started in Northern Arizona with Terry. Good morning, everyone. My name is Terry Medexa. I am the Executive Director of the Flagstaff Downtown Business Alliance. And I'm not sure if you can tell I'm in long sleeves because it's chilly up here today. Um, it's a brisk 75. So it's lovely and I invite everybody up um, at some point. Um, my favorite spot, especially right now, um, is really anywhere downtown or close to um, Snowball because all of our leaves are turning colors. So we in Flagstaff actually have fall and our leaves are now yellow and red. And so as much as I can be outdoors, even in downtown, um, or if I can get to Lockett Meadow, um, it's very peaceful with the bright, bright yellow against a bright blue sky. 
Um, and, and that's how I like to spend my time if I can. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, Terry. And that's, that's quite the pitch for Northern Arizona. I think we'll all be heading up there pretty soon if we can. Uh, and let's head into Phoenix. Jessica, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, yes, thank you all for listening in today. And Serena, thank you so much for hosting. Um, I am Jessica Bono, president of Urban Phoenix Project. We are a local ur urbanist nonprofit organization. We raise awareness and inspire action for community um, quality of life. Um, we envision a central Phoenix in which walking, biking, and public transit is as convenient and comfortable as driving. And I also work full time for Phoenix Revitalization Corporation. And what I get to do there is really serve underserved communities and really implement the policy that UPP is working towards. Excellent work. And, and maybe you can tell us about your coffee as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, um, oh, my public space. I love going oh, down to the state capitol. I live two blocks north of the state capitol, and it's such a great public space. Wesley Bolin Plaza is great to visit and really gives um, a lot of shade with the mature trees and um, wide sidewalks for biking, rollerblading. Um, it's just a great space that is very underutilized. And so I hope that more individuals really go and visit the state capitol. Thanks, Jessica. And over to Adrian. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Adrian New Darby. I'm the executive director of Pinnacle Prevention, and we are a nonprofit that's based in Chandler but serves Arizona statewide, focusing on food systems and active living, uh, with primarily a focus on the built environment initiatives in rural and tribal communities. And I would have to say my favorite public space is any one of our numerous farmers markets across Arizona. Excellent. Thanks, Adrian. Hopefully we'll be hearing more about those farmers markets as we chat more this morning. And finally, last but not least, in Tucson, Kylie. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Kylie Waldeck and I work with a nonprofit organization I helped co-found in 2011 called Living Streets Alliance. We advocate for a thriving Tucson by creating great streets for all of us. And our vision for streets is that they are great places that connect people to each other as well as to destinations. Um, my favorite public place is unintentional public place, our unintentional public places, places that weren't necessarily designed for um, the public to come together. We have, because we have, you know, developed in such a vast way in these valley cities, there's a lot of these spaces and my family loves to go explore them by bicycle. One of my favorites is the Cushing Street Bridge, which is a bridge that spans the Santa Cruz River on the south edge of the neighborhood where I live in Menlo Park on the west side of Tucson. It was built to connect the modern streetcar to downtown and the west side. And um, because the streetcar goes over the bridge, there's actually this like protected channelized sidewalk area with built-in concrete benches that if you go to, especially at evening time, gives you like 360 expansive views of the sun setting at a mountain, the Catalinas, and we just go we pack dinner and we sit and eat our dinner and watch the sunset on this bridge. I don't think that's what it was intended for, but that's what we use it for. That sounds amazing. Thanks for sharing, Kylie. Uh, it sounds like a particularly special spot. So I think we'll go ahead and, and stick with you, Kylie, as we start to get into some of our questions. And just a reminder that you also ask the panelists questions by typing them into the chat. But we'll get started by talking about some of the challenges that we're seeing COVID when it comes to public spaces. And I think everyone who's attending this webinar probably does not need to hear more about the challenges that are happening during COVID because we are all very well aware of them. But I think there have been some unique challenges that have happened with public spaces as we all know that it's safer to be outside 
uh, than inside. And that has created some challenges and some opportunities with public spaces. So we'll start with the challenges, but I promise we'll get to some of the exciting work and opportunities that are happening uh, in communities right now. So Kylie, do you want to talk a little bit about what you've seen in Southern Arizona? Sure. I mean, I can talk a lot about the challenges that COVID is posing to our work, which, um, like the other panelists here, is really about bringing people together um, and to have a different kind of conversation about the future we envision and how streets and public space play an integral, integral role in achieving that vision. So while we're stuck in a time where it's unsafe um, to bring people together, what do we do? Um, some of the things that we do, we're doing right now, which is having conversations with peers and colleagues in Arizona and across the United States about um, our work pre-COVID and um, what's been working well and what we can't wait to get back to doing. Some of those things include, and these are things that I hope that we see statewide in Arizona, um, our Open Streets event is called Cyclovia Tucson. So that is one of the events that we're best known for and have been known for. We've been managing it for uh, eight, seven, eight years, although it's been happening in Tucson for 10 years. And all you need to have that kind of an event is, um, and if you want to show, if is now a time that I can ask for pictures? Okay. If you can show of one of those pictures, that'd be great. Um, all you need to have this kind of event is streets, just public streets and um, the community will to designate those streets as um, places for people to gather car free for a day. So we do it temporarily um, for five hours on a Sunday in the spring and a Sunday in the fall. And there we see a, a picture of our open streets event in, this is the most recent one that we did, most recent. So we've had to cancel our last two events. This is from almost a year ago, 2019 on South 12th Avenue. Um, and open streets are not, you know, they're not original to Living Streets Alliance. This is an event that really was pioneered uh, in Seattle in the 70s, and then also in Latin America, Bogota, Colombia. And now you see these things happening all around the world. Um, and they're doing them more often than just a couple times a year. In a lot of places, they're doing them um, weekly, every Sunday and holiday in a lot of other countries. But, you know, for right now, we don't feel like we're in a place where we can organize this kind of event. Um, the next time we do it is tentatively April 2021. But I mean, the benefits of having this kind of event are enormous just because it really fosters a space for people to have conversations about um, what our streets are capable of and how they're so much more capable of um, just moving cars from point A to point B that they can really be a place for people to connect. Um, so this is obviously a challenge. Um, I think I'll stop here and maybe make space for other people to talk about other challenges. Thanks, Kylie. Uh, Adrian, what, what have you been seeing in Pinnacle Prevention's work? Yeah, I think in terms of challenges, what the pandemic has really brought out is that public spaces are a place for folks to decompress and socialize. And uh, with the stressors that the pandemic has brought out and just elevating on um, mental health issues and challenges and further um, creating challenges for those that were already isolated pre-COVID to begin with is how do we bring and value and bring folks back together with this human need that we have to feel connected to one another in a way that still is safe to do so and helps to kind of uh, mitigate uh, the the congested public spaces that we experience and i think also in terms of honoring places that served as public spaces pre-covid um but then had to quickly transition to be essential services such as farmers markets which are critical food access points in communities to allow them to still operate in a safe way, but still also serve as that connection point for the community is something that we have had to reimagine and rethink um, through all of this. But we see it as, you know, of course, a great opportunity. Oops. We're excited to hear more shortly about what those opportunities are too. And Jessica, what's your perspective on some of the challenges that have uh, occurred during COVID? 
Um, sure. So in the urban core in Phoenix, you know, we do have access to public spaces, but I think what has um, come up about COVID is that we don't have the infrastructure in place to really accommodate those individuals that are relying on public spaces. So for example, we don't have access to public restrooms like we should in public spaces. So I also think that, um, transit centers could be utilized better as public spaces and should also have uh, access to restrooms. I mean, this COVID taught us that we need access to clean cleanliness. And if we don't have access to wash our hands and, you know, take care of that germs, then, you know, we're more likely to spread. So I think that shows that we do have the right infrastructure in the downtown core with access to public spaces, but the individuals that are accessing those public spaces don't have the resources to um, to follow the guidelines that we would need during COVID. That's a really interesting point. And I'd imagine also it, something that we should learn from coming out of COVID too, that it's highlighted the importance of having those facilities, but it, it won't just end when this pandemic ends either. Yes. And, and Terry, can you share your thoughts from Northern Arizona? Sure. So I really think that COVID forced our hands up here. Um, you know, we have about 100 businesses in the core of our downtown. 95% of them are independently owned small businesses. And with the um, limitations on indoor capacity, related to COVID, it really forced us to think boldly and innovatively. And we had to rethink utilizing public spaces as a place for our businesses to expand. And so, you know, so often in our work, I think we're used to encouraging people to come, you know, come downtown, gather, the larger the group, the better in our public spaces. And we really had to do an about face and Gathering was not part of our messaging whatsoever. So utilizing public space as a place for our small businesses to expand became critical for their survival. We had many businesses with the, with the restrictions on their capacity. You know, our restaurants would have four or five tables and that is just not sustainable for them. And so for our downtown to survive, for our businesses to survive, we had to rethink utilizing public spaces for, for business and for people to actually spread out, which is just the opposite of what we're used to. We want people to come together normally. Um, so we utilized our streets and our sidewalks and our alleyways um, as places for people to spread out when walking. We added tables for people to have outdoor where they could sit and eat outdoors. And then we also came up with a way to have our businesses actually expand their capacity in our public spaces. So, um, you know, we, we really had to rethink how we normally think of public spaces. That seems like a, a good place to dig into a little bit more because I think Flagstaff has some excellent examples of how you have rethought those public spaces. So uh, I'll bring up some of your pictures, Terry, if you want to talk a little bit more about some of the work that you and the Downtown Flagstaff Business Alliance have done. Sure. Um, so the, the first thing we did is we looked at the low hanging fruit. Um, we looked at Heritage Square, which is a public space. It's sort of where we have um, many signature events. And this is a, a, a picture um, of Heritage Square. And we added um, picnic tables and we added bistro tables. And all of the tables were spaced six to eight feet apart. Um, we had signage, and I think there is a, a picture of the language on the signage, and this really is key. Um, the, the signage, I'm not sure that you can read it, but it does say that masks are required, tables have been spaced um, to be distant, so please don't move them. Uh, we want a maximum of six people per party. And then we actually came up with um, 
sanitized wipes that we that we made and put on each table so we encourage people to wipe tables before and after and then we put be respectful patient and kind because um the it, the, the the, the reaction to COVID um, amongst the community is just really divisive and people get angry and frustrated easily. So we wanted this to be a positive experience for people. So we learned very quickly that this messaging had to be about public health and it had to be about helping our businesses survive. If we encourage people to gather, like I was saying earlier, our community up here would have revolted and we would have taken some heat um, from our Flagstaff locals and residents. And so all of our messaging is about um, public health and business survival. And so this signage is all over. So our low hanging fruit was um, putting tables and chairs and messaging at Heritage Square. And then straight across um, in this picture is an alleyway. Um, that is another public space. We put some tables and chairs and actually closed the alley and allowed people to um, grab some food or coffee and sit down. Both Heritage Square and the alley are open seating so anybody can come and anybody can sit there. Um, then we have Aspen um, which is one of our major streets through downtown. And these, Aspen, which is what you're looking at, we have very small businesses along Aspen and they don't have anywhere else to expand. They don't have private parking lots. They don't have patios. All they had was the street. And so working with the city, um, and, and it took us a long time to get there, but working with the city, we were able to provide a parking um, lane as well as one travel lane for expanded seating. So now uh, one lane of traffic is still through, one lane is closed where businesses can expand and each business sort of has their own flavor and they provide their own seating, um, you know, but it's worked really, really well. Um, there, the sidewalk is open and so pedestrians can still walk. Uh, there is a little bike lane so people can bike comfortably um, and then people have a chance to spread out and be outdoors where they feel more comfortable. So um, we've had this in place since October 3rd, or um, excuse me, since August 3rd and we have been tracking with our businesses and their sales have gone up and you can see on their on the charts um, that the start date for their sales to go up is in fact august 3rd and so it has worked out very well for us in flagstaff thanks so much for sharing terry i know there are a few uh a few comments in the chat and i think you addressed jim mcpherson's question about uh how the city of flagstaff how you worked with the city of flagstaff to get the get this into place and perhaps we'll have a little bit more time to come back around to talking a little bit more about flagstaff uh because as as someone else, uh, as Jennifer Keogh said, this it does look like a lovely place to spend time, and I can personally vouch that it is. So please go to Flagstaff. Well, and and we would welcome you. And I I will tell you, um, there are a lot of lessons learned in this process. Um, we worked on this with our city partners for about three months, and it didn't start out with immediate support. I mean, it when we. Um, pitch the idea to our city friends and partners, um, there was a lot of resistance. Um, and, you know, we have risk managers and police, and they're doing their best to keep the public and pedestrians safe, which I understand. Um, but to begin to get people to think differently than what has been done before was really the challenge. And so it took us some time but once we found a few people who really sort of bought in and supported it, we found momentum and then we finally got there. But it wasn't easy. 
<laughs> it, it, this kind of work never is, but kudos to you for persevering. I, I know that Adrian had some interesting perspective on why public spaces shouldn't be just allowed to do these things and that this should really be more part of the fabric of, of what we do in cities and, and towns. So Adrian, can you share your thoughts on what the opportunities are here? Yeah, I, I mentioned that we see this as a really critical moment to kind of reimagine um, our public spaces and what we've seen as a win is cities being very flexible and creative and what they've been allowing um, you know, community to be able to do and businesses be able to do. But from the policy lens, what we'd like to see shift and change is, is that this isn't just something temporary or something that's allowed. I'm hoping that we're moving and shifting policy into a place where this just becomes the norm and how we design cities. And so what we're looking, you know, from the city level all the way up to the state policy level is to really think about um, how we reallocate and utilize space to make it more human and person centered and letting that be the driving force and the driving factor behind all of that. Um, if this has been able to happen in such a short period of time where we see the streeteries and we see flexibilities for markets and we see the blocking off of parking lanes to allow that to be utilized for parklets and things like this. Um, if it could happen so flexibly so quickly right now, from our lens and our perspective, we don't see why this isn't something that couldn't or shouldn't become permanent. Um, and so we encourage all of you that are on the call to work with your city council if you're not already to advocate and to showcase uh, the best practices and the wins like these in the communities and to share data and to speak with community members and show up at city council meetings so that this becomes a permanent place in our society. Thanks, Adrian. I think you hit on a really good point there that we're starting to see some things that before COVID, people would have said, oh, we could never do that. That's impossible to shut down a lane of traffic, to uh, create these streeteries, which is my new favorite term, that, that those things would have taken years and years. But now, out of necessity, we're starting to see that these things are happening. And, and Jessica or Kylie, I'll, I'll kick it over to either one of you to talk about it, if you have any examples of some of the opportunities that you're seeing and work that might be uh, ex expedited in a way that it wasn't before COVID. Um, sure, I'll jump in. Um, I think one um, tool that we could use is technology. So for example, um, the crosswalk, cross signals should be automatic instead of requiring an individual to push the button to cross the street. So I think that's one um, tool that we can start implementing um, now is that, you know, every crosswalk should be automatic and we should assume that pedestrians are going to use the crosswalk because streets are designed for pedestrian cyclists and drivers. Um, so that's one way. And then um, these, the another way is that um, we can just really start moving the conversation to slower streets. I know that here in Phoenix, um, when we're getting into downtown drivers, they don't really recognize that the speed limit has changed. So if we're coming west into downtown from 7th Avenue on Van Buren, it goes from 35 to 25 and the speed limit still continues at 40 throughout the downtown core. And I think that this instance could have, could have really pushed the city of Phoenix to implement slower streets. So it could be from, you know, taking one, one lane of traffic and really trying to make it a pedestrian realm and just like really just trying to institute slower streets. I don't think drivers are very cognizant of the speed limit and just being aware that they have to share the street. So I think those are two things that we can continue to implement as COVID um, relieves us. But I think that those are two ways that we really need to start moving towards as a city. 
great examples of some policy changes that could make a huge difference in allowing us to be safe and active. And I'd imagine that Kylie has some other thoughts on that too, since that's really what Living Streets Alliance does. Yeah, I think I wanna be sure to talk about um, a couple of things. You know, we have been encouraging folks in Tucson and beyond to rethink our public space long before COVID. And um, Serena, maybe you could pull up a couple of the um, other photos I included, in particular, maybe that traffic circle getting painted. So um, we have, and okay, before I talk about this photo, though, I want to talk about the relationship between rethinking public space and the need to engage and bring the community along with the work at every step of the way. So, you know, in a lot of places, like, you know, Flagstaff are rolling out these parklets now in response to a, a business need. And fortunately, there are a lot of resources out there already for people to look at and take and, and you know, learn about the different kinds of materials that can be used. But I think we have to be really careful that we don't concentrate these efforts in the places that, you know, are the easy places to do them first, where we have to think a lot about um, equitable distribution and deployment of resources in our other parts of our of our city and town, you know, in, in downtown Flagstaff and downtown Phoenix, and yes, in downtown Tucson too, you know, it makes sense to um, reconfigure the public space to be able to allow people to spread out, both because that has historically been where people have come together that's where we have a high concentration of eateries and um, retail spaces but there are lots of other places in all of our cities where people are gathering where they have businesses where they have restaurants and we ought to be thinking about ways that that we can extend these kinds of options for folks there too and I mean, and I'll just mention too that in Tucson and I'm sure this is happening in other communities as well the city council um, expedited the process to convert your private parking lot into outdoor seating so that that could be really replicated in all different parts uh, of the city quickly. Um, but back to rethinking public space for a second, you know, with COVID happening, it doesn't mean that a lot of um, transportation improvement projects are on hold. They're not. It makes community engagement uh, a lot harder to do in person. And I think we have to be really careful and mindful of that as we're thinking about um, decisions being made and investments being made without the input or the buy-in for community. So what I wanna talk about with this picture really quickly is um, one way that we worked with um, a community school, Ochoa Community School and neighborhoods that live around the school that walk to that school to reclaim um, a bit of public space in the middle of an intersection where two streets intersect. And we um, installed a technically temporary traffic circle with um, flex posts. You can see the flex posts are all around that circle. And you can see um, large yellow stepped planters with native plants in them. And you know, I say temp technically temporary because these aren't supposed to last forever. However, we invested good materials in these um, in, in this traffic circle so that it could last as long as the neighborhood wanted it to. It's also part of a larger planning effort to eventually turn this corridor. If you look carefully to the north there, you can see downtown Tucson. This is actually going to become eventually a um, bicycle boulevard corridor to get folks into and out of downtown into other destinations south of here. And we wanted to make sure that the community knew about those planned investments and were brought into the process and could have conversations and feel heard while simultaneously doing something that they felt reflected their community and provided safety benefits um, for folks going back and forth to school. And then um, maybe I could talk a little bit about the other photo too really quickly. Uh, this one, yeah. So in Tucson, we don't actually have um, any permanent parklets yet. Um, there's a lot of temporary parklet action happening again in our downtown. We hope soon there will be a lot of temporary parklets in response to COVID um, on Fourth Avenue. But this is an example of a of a parklet that a temporary. It's parklet like that we put in um, at the intersection of 6th Avenue and 7th Street. This is just north of downtown Tucson in an area that's actually currently being torn up for a huge 
uh, roadway project funded by our regional transportation authority to create uh, a, an eventual bypass of downtown. It's called the Barasa Downtown Link Aviation Parkway. And uh, we saw an opportunity here. This, this, was, this project is now over two, well, two years old. We saw an opportunity here to preview to the community what this reconfigured intersection could look like after that roadway project is complete, which is supposed to take, you know, at a minimum five years. Meanwhile, there were all these businesses popping up in this, you know, expanding part of downtown. And we wanted people to feel like they had, you know, a comfortable gathering space in what is really excess asphalt that isn't being utilized by either parking or anything else. There were also a number of um, traffic and travel concerns here. This is a four-way stop intersection, but there's a number of um, left turn bays and people were, you know, either not seeing the four way stops There's a lot of crashes here. So we um, implemented this again with flex posts, paint, planters and some nice cafe seating, which was adopted by the nearby coffee shop. Speaking of coffee day right there um, at the building that says 403, that's a coffee shop. And they would take in the, the patio furniture and bring it out every day. Um, but we wanted to use this as a way to get people thinking and talking about what's possible on excess overbuilt asphalt streets. Thanks so much for sharing those examples, Kylie, and for, for making the point to that we can't just be concentrating these opportunities to rethink public spaces and these public investments in our urban areas, but that we have to think about all communities and equitably distribute these opportunities across, across our communities. I also wanted to make sure that I, if, to highlight an example that came up in the chat from Kingman that their city council had approved a parklet program for their main street. And after COVID, they amended the program to have a 90% match and none have been built yet, but we're seeing in a uh, more rural community in Arizona that there's uh, also an interest in parklets, which is really exciting to hear some of those examples. And thanks to everyone who shared all of the tremendous resources in the chat. It, it's clear that we are incredibly lucky in Arizona to have just a lot of people who care deeply about our public spaces and connecting people with each other. I know, I know there have also been some comments about how important it is to incorporate shade and there are some examples in downtown Phoenix on 6th Avenue south of Roosevelt. Thanks, Reed, for sharing that, that example and how 20 years later there is a tremendous amount of shade on 6th Avenue. So I definitely want to keep the conversation going uh, and we've started to delve into some of the policies and systems that need to be changed to, to remove some of the barriers to rethink public spaces. So I'll open this question up to any of the panelists, any of our experts uh, joining us today to talk about what some of the things are that are still kind of getting in the way of really rethinking public spaces. I think I, if I can, I want to jump in because sure. I actually really have a question for Carrie. Um, in the conversations in Tucson, where we're trying to talk with um, business districts, business owners, and facilitate the conversation between them and the city to expedite the parklet model. So the parklet model for us is, it really means like you have a business or an eatery, there's a sidewalk out front of it, and then next to the sidewalk, there's a parallel parking space or two that if you can get permission from the city, you can repurpose that, that parallel parking space to become extra outdoor seating, extra retail space. And for us, you know, we hear, and, and to the city's credit, they are very interested in helping businesses figure out ways to survive and get through these next few months or years hopefully not years, but we keep hearing the same things, which is like a lot of times um, in order for them to get these temporary revocable easements to put extra seating out into the parking spots, you have to make up for the extra parking you're taking away. Or, you, or there's still this assumption that like, uh, you know, the tools that we have to be able to grant these permissions are still from the old way of thinking and they're not responding flexibly or fast enough. So maybe you could talk about how you overcome that in Flagstaff. Right. Um, so what we did is, is really two things. 
Um, and I'll say Flagstaff is set up just as you described. We have a business, an open sidewalk, and then we have parallel parking, um, a street, and then parallel parking, street sidewalk. Um, and there were really two, maybe three things that really got us to where we are. One is we looked at best practices. Um, we were not the only ones, nor were we the first ones that were doing this. Um, Colorado was a great example. So we pulled from um, virtually every city, small and large in Colorado, that's already doing this. And um, we showed pictures and we gave testimonials about how it was working. And we did that both with our city council, our city leadership, but also the businesses. Um, this was really new thinking for our businesses and they were very unsure, how are they going to get their deliveries? Where are their customers going to park? And so we showed them what it could look like. We sort of opened their brains up to thinking about outdoor dining, you know, being using color to bring vibrancy. Um, so looking at those best practices, I think was one strategy. Um, um, and then looking at how they could actually help keep their business going financially. Um, so that was the other thing is that this was all opportunity for them to keep their business operational and to bring in revenue. So we were able to get um, their thinking sort of in those two ways. I think the other thing is um, looking for partnership where we might not have had it before. Um, so in this case, um, the city put together a team to work with us and there was maybe 20, 25 people on this team and, and led by our city manager who said, you know, we're going to do this. I think that gave city staff the framework to work towards success versus to throw up obstacles. And so we found support in really interesting areas. We have um, a beautification manager who happened to have some budget who said, well, we can contribute um, wine barrels filled with flowers. Um, and so that budget didn't come from us. It came from um, sort of a tertiary source and it doubled as um, safety. And so we have something that's beautification and safety. Um, and so, you know, things like that, partnerships like that um, got the city and our businesses thinking, you know, this might be something that we try. And, and I'll say, we pitched this as a pilot. And the second it went up, we already had people asking, how do we make this permanent? Um, and so now the conversation is, how do we get through winter? What are we going to do, you know, as we go into winter to utilize these public spaces? But now it's, what are we going to do next year to expand on this? And so, um, you know, looking at best practices, making sure the business community and the city saw value, and then finding partnership where we might not have had it before is, is what, um, you know, really got us to, um, to what we have in place today. Great question, Kylie, and thanks, Terry, for all of the insight. I really appreciate it you sharing that and uh, you have an invitation apparently to come down to Tucson during winter and utilize their public spaces. Um, but helpful examples, especially as a, a lot of the state starts to enter some nicer weather months. I, I know there was a question earlier about the parking structures in other cities that are being used as temporary housing and if our panelists had any thoughts. So I'll have maybe Adrienne see if she can, can address that question as well. Yeah, I think um, we approach that lens from a shared use agreement and perspective, especially in communities and, and rural communities who um, Mitch may be much more strapped for resources. Um, and so from the shared use agreement lens, whether it is parking structures or it is school playgrounds and sites or whatever that might be is not 
viewing it as a this for that, or if we do this and we must be taking away from something else, but rather as a win-win and how can we combine it and use it for both purposes. Um, we have seen, you know, from the climate perspective, from what Terry talks about, just preparing for winter um, up north, you know, down in the valley and in the metro areas where we're experiencing heat, unlike we've ever experienced before. We've seen farmers markets who have utilized um, covered parking structures. The, their farmers markets as well. Um, downtown Phoenix farmers market does this really well, in addition to the integration of misters and cooling systems as well too. Um, it can be covered parking um, structures can be utilized not just I absolutely think as a as an option for the housing crisis that we're in, but also for um, a a space to be physically active and to move around um, where you're shaded and safe as well too. Um, from the shared use agreement lens, you know, a survey that we were recently looking at showed that the primary motivators of why people were seeking out public spaces during COVID-19 was primarily for either exercise or relaxation. And so through that lens, we see shared use agreements, whether through school sites and playgrounds or through covered parking structures, as that solution for that as well too. So if we don't have the funding to erect a whole new park or whatever that might be is how do we utilize and capitalize on what exists in the community? And much of that that we've seen has been gleaned from the wisdom of the community members themselves. So wisdom lies within the community members who live there every day and have oftentimes pre-COVID been utilizing these spaces for such purposes for a very long time. And so just the opportunity to glean that wisdom from the community members in terms of what they need, what do they use it for, and what are their motivations, um, I think oftentimes that's where the solutions lie. Really, really wise words, Adrian. And and Jessica or Kylie, I'd be interested. I know this is a rethinking public spaces discussion and not a community engagement discussion. So that could be its whole its own whole day online forum. But I, I'd be curious if you either of you have examples from your work about what some of the best practices are for seeking out that input and making sure that our public spaces are really reflective of what the community wants and needs, especially when it is hard to gather in person right now. Yeah, so I'll just add that, you know, um, much of the conversation has been around businesses, but, you know, we also have to think of how residents use public spaces and their access to public spaces. So in my work, I very much implement um, policy in underserved communities. So, you know, in an urban core, complete streets mean something totally different to underserved communities. So when I say um, complete streets in um, underserved communities, I'm talking about the um, pavement, making sure that sidewalks are complete, our safe routes to school. Um, so these are more of the infrastructure needs that underserved communities need in order to access public spaces. Um, and so it's just very much so a different concept in certain neighborhoods. Um, but I think that overall, the need to connect individuals to public spaces is very great. Um, you know, individuals that want to access public spaces, they need to also feel safe. So in some um, neighborhoods, safety is also a concern. But I think that the more that we can just implement a broader sense of community and connection between green spaces and people, we'll just see that in return. So in terms of economic development, in terms of health equity, um, these are the, the things that pre-COVID need to occur as well, instead of, you know, just focusing on, okay, COVID, these are the gaps that we're missing, but overall, how can we just really ensure that neighborhoods have that access and quality of um, recreation that they need? And Kylie? And I, I, sure, I, I will just say that, um, you know, undergirding all of these conversations around rethinking public space, during a pandemic is uh, the very real um, fear and, and um, very recent traumatic history that many people feel um, around displacement and gentrification. And as you know, um, economic uncertainty is 
we're beginning to just wrap our arms around what that looks like and we're beginning to see the end of the you know moratorium on evictions tunnel there is real fear that people's lives are going to be upended here very shortly and at the same time uh, as i mentioned before there's a lot of decisions being made and people are not feeling like they're part of the conversation decisions that will affect their lives decisions that can shape the way their neighborhood looks um and I mean, recently here in Tucson, we, we, we had um, a very important decision made last week where we had to decide if we were gonna continue with our central business district and continue to give developers um, government property lease excise taxes so that they can keep um, building, you know, proposing and building new developments, particularly downtown and partic particularly in the central business core. And we saw a lot of grassroots organizing against those decisions being made because we are fearing a, a housing shortage there's not enough affordable housing um, the places where people want to develop most are in our um, historic desirable neighborhoods that are particularly close to downtown and we don't feel like people don't feel like there's a plan that that includes them and how to be able to stay in their homes and in their communities and so i don't i don't have any answers for that i just want to be able to voice that and to also say that the um, the kinds of road projects that we do the murals that are painted on streets the repurposing of excess overbuilt space um, you know is not universally embraced by everyone for some people even a painted mural traffic circle can signalize big changes coming to their neighborhood that they're um, that they're fearful of and so it's on it's on all of us to just keep that in mind and do continually try to do better and listen better I really appreciate you bringing that up, Kylie. One thing that you said when we all chatted last week that has really stuck with me is that unequal deployment of resources is a source of trauma for people in communities. And I don't know if you want to expand on that anymore, but I thought that that was a really important point as we all rethink public spaces that we have to keep that kind of past trauma and, and its implications in mind as we move forward. Yeah, I think we're all, all of us in our different fields are very familiar with the deficit narrative, right? Which is, here's all the things that our community needs. Here's all the things that they don't have. Here's all the opportunities they haven't been given. Um, but going back to something that Adrian said, the communities are sources of wealth. They know their communities the best. They know what, um, they know what decisions ought to be made. And I think we all need to reconfigure our decision-making and power structures to focus on those folks first rather than top down. So we're getting close to the end of our, our time together. And I know there's been a ton of great examples of great work happening in Arizona. There have been ideas about how best to make sure that public spaces include all communities and all people in Arizona. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation around uh, slow streets and shade, and there's been more of that in the, the chat with a wealth of resources. So I just am really appreciative to all of our panelists and to everyone who's attending this webinar, and especially for contributing these ideas and questions and uh, your resources in the chat. So that's uh, also very helpful. And uh, thank you for being so generous with your your thoughts. So I think we'll go ahead and start to wrap up and wind down and I'll have each of the panelists share what one final one final question, your answer to what change to public spaces do you want to keep after this pandemic is over? And we will start in Southern Arizona this time. So Kylie, what, what do you want to keep post COVID? Two things. Um, I want to. I want people to realize how much abundance we have in our public streets as public spaces. I think we're all, we're on our way there, but it's going to become even more apparent as the weather gets cooler and we can utilize those spaces more flexibly. And I want us as a city to you know really lead from behind with the community facing forward, making the decisions that are best for itself. All right, so we're, we're keeping community-driven decisions. 
I love it. Moving to Phoenix, Jessica, what are, what are you hoping that we keep post COVID? Um, sure. So I'm hoping that we keep, you know, spaces open and safe um, for residents, but I'm also hoping that the city implements the um, crosswalk signals being automatic, as well as cutting down the time between the hawks. So when you press the hawk button, you know, the time to cross the street is much shorter. But I think, you know, um, during this time, I think we should just really be cognizant of who public spaces really serve. And in the urban core, they are serving our unsheltered population. And I think that if we create a more atmosphere and environment that is more welcoming to them, I think it'll inspire them to want to um, pursue, you know, the changes in their life. But I think this just serves to the overall conversation that public spaces need to be designed for the people, regardless if they're coming, but more importantly, for the individuals that are already here in the urban core. Um, so in access to getting to downtown, so complete streets, um, just better designed streets. And so, yeah, that's what I'm hoping is that we just kind of re-envision what you know, safe streets mean access to using um, a pedestrian realm and just more so cognizant of other individuals that are accessing downtown and um, amenities that really serve the community as a greater whole. I love it. All great things that we all should be working on in our communities. And Adrian, what, what do you have to contribute to this list? I would just add that I hope what has happened becomes permanent and not just temporary. Um, and I hope that moving forward, we have, we recognize that uh, the solutions lie within the community and the wisdom is there within the community and that we're really allowing, um, just to, to echo what Kylie has said, uh, community members to lead this work moving forward. Thanks, Adrian. And Terry. Well, I echo the comment about more permanence. Um, we've seen it firsthand. Um, we were looking at spaces that otherwise have been used for deliveries and cars and um, our alleyways and our parking spaces now have become places for people and bikes and um, outdoor dining and just sort of um, spending time. And I'd, I, I think there's a demand here to see more of that and more permanence. Um, so we're working on it. Um, you know, so hopefully the next time we have a webinar like this, we'll have more examples to share, but people definitely want to see it. And I think the second thing I would say is, um, hopefully this leads to a shift in mindset. Um, you know, getting people to think a little differently than, well, what we've always done, or, well, gosh, we don't have a code on the books for that. Um, you know, COVID forced our hand, but going forward, you know, it's this kind of thinking um, innovatively, thinking boldly, doing things that might be different um, that's gotten us to where we are. And so it's that shift in mindset that I hope We've seen a little bit of it, and I, I hope um, we continue to see that going forward. That seems like the perfect way to wrap things up today, a shift in mindset that we keep going forward. I just want to thank all of our panelists. Thank you, Adrian, Jessica, Kylie, and Terry. You've been a wealth of knowledge, and I just am so grateful to you and your organizations for taking the time to be with us today and to share examples of what's happening in communities across Arizona. And I'm really thankful that we had such an amazing audience today. I've never seen a chat blow up like this in a forum before. So thank you for taking the time to be here and share your thoughts, your ideas. There've been a few things that have come up in the chat already about future online discussions that we might have. So if you have other ideas, don't hesitate to reach out and you'll be getting a recording of this webinar in the next day or so. And thank you all and take care. Have a great day. Bye everyone.